Okay, good afternoon everyone. Uh, this is office hours. I'm going to record this session just so that some students can see it who asked me they wanted to see the recording, so I'm going to record. Um, can everyone see the screen okay? Do we need to turn the lights down? Is it okay? Okay. Um, okay, so the first question was <laughs> what's the difference between 122 and 141? <laughs> and and, and the, the answer is 122 is what's called business calc. Uh, which, generally speaking, is mathematically easier, but you have to do word problems. And then 141 is basically the opposite of that. It's much more mathematically rigorous, I guess. Um, so you might have to deal with more complicated functions and stuff like that. And then, of course, in the business calc class, there's also a lot of stuff in there about like, oh, the profit function or the revenue function. Come on in. Come on in. Just close the door behind you. Profit or revenue functions or cost functions and those sorts of things. Um, so I would say, yeah, it's more applications based, which is why you have more word problems. Um, so 141, you will have like lecture uh, two days a week or three days a week and then also you'll have recitation two days a week so it's like five credit hours or four credit hours maybe I think it's five and then 122 should be basically like three credit hours you'll just be in class three days a week and you won't have a uh, recitation so less class in 122 generally like speaking students who are like who tend to struggle a lot more with math, get funneled into 122. It tends to be a little bit of an easier class on the whole. Um, but uh, yeah, that's basically my spiel. Does that answer your question? Yes. OK, cool. Then, oh, shoot. You know what I forgot is my textbook. You all don't have a physical textbook, do you? No. Oh, and I don't have, I can't use my laptop either because it's being used right now. Okay, well, we'll use the e-textbook. How about that? Um, okay, so do you all have questions for me for, for office hours while I pull up the thing? Why do I keep finding sequels? So the sections relevant for the quiz are sections 1.4 and 1.5. So you want to talk about any of the content in there? Um, 1.4, there was a homework question. Okay. So it was f of x is equal to 3x squared um, minus x minus 2. And then it said find x such that, and then in parentheses, x and then negative 2 is on the graph of h. Uh, negative x or just x, too? Negative two, okay. Is on the graph. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a great question. So the one goes up, so. Oh thanks. Alright. So let's try this one together. Okay. Um how do the rest of you feel about this one? Is this one that gave you a little this bit of trouble? Right? Yeah. Oh I don't know what this is from. Is this one point four? Okay, this is 1.4, question 22. All right. So uh, what did the rest of you think of this? Because this homework's already been due, right? Mm -hmm. So you guys presumably tried this problem. How did you feel about it? Well, at first. Sorry? It was just frustrating at first. Frustrating at first? Okay, cool. Well, let's do it together. Um, well, I think this tests something really fundamental about uh, the relationship between a function and its graph, right? the relationship between a function and its graph. So let's imagine for a second uh, that we had an x value such that this was on the graph. Okay, so what would that look like? Well, there would be an x value, right? And this point would be at whatever that x value is. It would look like x comma 2, and it'd be like this point right here maybe, right? Where this, where the height of the, uh, height of the point is 2 and the left and right is going to be x right so in particular this this point could be anywhere right well actually it can't be anywhere it, can, it has to have height 2 
uh, but it could be anywhere like this and this and this, right? So we're looking for a point which is on the graph of the function, which means that this is a parabola, right? So we know the parabola looks something like this, right? So we want to find the x value such that uh, the height of that x value, when I plug it into this function, gives me negative 2, right? No, okay, so I put it at the wrong spot, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, y'all. It's been a long day, and I had way too much coffee. Like, way too much coffee. Okay, so we, we want it to be down there somewhere, maybe. Something like this that looks better. And I don't know what it's going to look like. It might actually look more like... Oh, my God. Okay. It might actually look like that, right? Or like that. We don't know what it looks like. But the point is that I'm trying to find the x value such that, well, what goes here is f of x, right? Points on the graph are all the points x comma f of x. What I want is to find x such that x comma f of x is equal to x comma negative 2, which means that I want to find x such that what? f of x equals negative 2, right? Does that make sense? Okay, so this just comes from how do I get the height of the point on the graph? Well, you take the x value and you plug it in. So in this case, instead of saying, well, the x value is this, what's the height? They're saying, the height is this, what's the x value? Does that make sense? Okay, so let's solve it. So we know we want to set f of x equal to negative 2, and I have a formula for f of x. So I can just solve that by setting them equal. All right, so now what? I'm stuck. Somebody help me. Add two, Add two to both sides. Why? So well, right, so the, the reason that I'm going to add two to both sides is that if I want to factor the, the quadratic, I must always first get zero on the other side, OK? You can only factor when we have a 0 on one side. So 3x squared minus x, and then we add 2 to both sides, right? So I get uh, equals 0, yeah? OK, now what? OK, so I'm going to factor this. But this looks like 3x squared minus x. I'm used to factoring things which look like this. But what, 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 what's going on with this? There's only two terms. Exactly. Both of these two terms have a common factor. OK, the greatest common factor is what we always start with when we're factoring. So the very first thing I can do here is I can take that x out. And what am I left with inside? OK, 3x minus 1. Does everyone see how we accomplish that? Yeah? OK, good. So now I have two things. If I have one thing and I multiply it with another thing and I get 0, then what must be true? One, must be zero. one of those two things has to be 0, right? There's no way to multiply two numbers and get 0 unless one of the numbers that I was multiplying was already 0, right? So either x is equal to 0, or 3x minus 1 is equal to 0. And this is the zero product property. Try abbreviate ZPP, just for fun. And this tells us that x could also be, uh, what, 1 third? OK, great. So in this case, we got two answers. Either x is 0, or x equals 1 third. Is there a way that you have to figure out which one? Like, is, if you're plugging it into that? Um, order pair, do you have to pick one or can it be either? So, you mean like this order pair? Is that what you're talking about? No, the original one. This one? Yeah. Okay, so in this case, there's two points. There's the point 0, comma, negative 2 is on the graph, and the point 1 third, comma, negative 2 is on the graph. Okay, so let's see what this, well, let's see what this function looks like here. The 3x squared minus x minus 2. Uh, Desmos. 3x squared minus x minus 2. OK, so let's take a look at this. What does this look like? OK, so remember, what are we looking for? 
We're looking for the locations on this graph whose height is negative 2. Here's negative 2. You can see the graph of this function has two points where the height is negative 2. This is the point 0 comma negative 2. Okay? And since this line, if you take it up, that's 0 0.5, right? This line is 0 0.5, so if I go a little bit back, this is like 0 0.33, right? AKA 1 one third. Mm -hmm. So we have two points. The first point is 0 comma negative 2. The second point is 1 third comma negative 2. Okay? So what, what is the point here? The point is that if you have a question like this that asks, find the x values for which the height of the function is a certain height. What you're actually asking is find the locations where the graph of where the graph of our parabola intersects the line y equals negative 2. We're asking for the places where they intersect. And of course, where are these going to intersect? It's going to be where this is the function g of x equals negative 2. And we want to know where is f of x equal to g of x. So that's exactly what we did, right? We took 3x squared minus x minus 2, and we set it equal to negative 2. And that's how we find the points of intersection of these two functions. So there's a whole variety of different ways in which you can look at this problem. So in what kinds of ways can a parabola intersect with a line? Well, there's three options. Either it touches the line at two points, or it doesn't touch the line at any points. And what's the last option? Is, it one more Is if it touches it just once, right at the vertex, right? Those are the three options. OK, does that? I don't even remember. Who, who was asking that? You, Lauren was asking about the two points, right? Yeah. So does that answer your question? Yes. OK, good. All right. Um, so if I asked a question like this on the, uh, on the uh, exam or, the, uh, or on the quiz, since it just says find x, I would be happy if you just give me 0 and 1 third. But if I said find the points on the graph of this function with height negative 2, then I would probably want the points in like ordered pair form. Make sense? All right, cool. Uh, anyone have another question? All right. It was, oh, well, there was like a million and a half questions. It was like five points, five parts. Okay. Get my to look at it. All right, that's fine. Thank you. OK, so it says, I don't like this mustard color. we got to change that. Pink. Pink? OK. f of x equals 3x divided by the square root of 25 minus x squared. And we are supposed to find f of 0, f of 1, um, f of 5, f of negative 5, and f of negative x. OK. So this is a pretty standard um, function notation question. Uh, they're asking us, OK, well, do you understand? If I give you the function rule, do you know how to find out what the height of the function is at these given x values? OK. Or do you know how to evaluate this? algebraically, which means basically plug in, right? So let's try these one by one. Let's start with the first one. How am I going to try to evaluate what f of 0 is going to be? Should I set this equal to 0? 
So what we actually want to do in this case is we want to plug in zero for x, okay? So this here, when, we, when they give us the rule like this, f of x is equal to something like this, what they're saying is if you want to know what f of zero is, okay, I'm putting a zero where x is on the left-hand side. To figure out what goes on the right-hand side, I just do the same thing on the right-hand side, okay? So I'm just going to plug zero on the left-hand side and on the right side. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. So f of zero is gonna be what? We're gonna do three times zero, and I'm always gonna plug with parentheses, right? And I'm gonna divide now by the square root of 25 minus, and I'm gonna take zero and square it. Okay, so what do I get on top? Zero. zero. And how about on bottom? I get square root of 25, right? which is just zero divided by five, which is what? Zero divided by five oh, zero. is zero. <laughs> I thought you were asking the square root. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's okay. So yeah, zero divided by five is zero. So f of zero in this case is just zero. All right, any questions on how I did that? Okay. Uh, then let's talk about f of 1. Okay, f of 1, what am I going to get? Oh, well, I'm going to do the same thing all over again, but with 1s. 3 times 1 divided by square root 25 minus uh, 1, all squared, is equal to 3 over the square root of 24. Am I done? No, no. technically I should simplify, right? which first is going to start with simplifying this square root. Is there anything I can simplify? Let's make the four. Yeah, I can break this up into a 4 and a 6, right? And then the 4 can come out. So this is the same as 3 over what? 2, two square root 6. Okay, now I'm done, right? Mm -hmm. No, what do I still have left to do? If I want to simplify completely. I have to get rid of the square root in the denominator, right? Okay, how do I do that? Well, both sides by square root of six. Yeah, by both sides you mean the oh, well, numerator and denominator, right? Well. Yeah, multiply the top and the bottom by the square root of six. So what do I get on the bottom? Well, on the top I get three square root six, and on the bottom I get two times what? Yeah, if I take the square root of 6 times the square root of 6, I just get 6. Why would you multiply 2 square root 6 on the top of um, Because the, you can think about it like this. You can, okay, maybe it would help if you saw it like this. If you see 3 over 2 root 6, this is the same as 3 <coughs> over 2 times the square root of 6. Agree? Okay. Would, the, would you then agree that this is the same as 3 over 2 times 1 over the square root of 6? Yes? yes? And you'd agree with me that this part is fine, right? Mm -hmm. There's no problem with this. There's no square root there. So the only thing I have to deal with is this square root 6. And you'll see how it's going to go away when I just multiply by the square root of 6 here. So let me show you that. How would that work? I, I'm going to multiply the denominator times the square root of 6. So all told, I get 2 times 6 in the denominator. So I get 3 root 6 in the numerator. And then what in the denominator? I get 12. Can I simplify any more? Yeah. yeah, one more time, right? 3 divided by 12 becomes 1 over 4, right? So I don't even need to write 1. I can just write square root 6 over 4. Yes? Okay, now I'm done. Okay, so what would happen, by the way, if you if you decided to multiply the top and bottom uh, by two root six? Well, in the end, you wouldn't have three root six over twelve. You would actually have uh, six root six over twenty-four, and then you could simplify again. So, I mean, if you want to multiply by two root six, I guess there's no problem. Uh, it's just doing a little more work than you need to. All right, any questions on how we did that one?
All right. Uh, any other questions from the homework that we should talk about? Oh, wait. I guess we should probably finish more of these, shouldn't we? Yeah. There's like th three more things to do. Jeez, I just cannot function today. Okay, so uh, let, let me just copy down a couple more of these to the next page. So again, what we're trying to do is figure out what this is for f of 5 and f of negative 5. Okay, so if I plug in 5, what am I going to get? 3 times 5 divided by square root 25 minus 5 quantity squared, which is going to be 15 divided by the square root of 25 minus 25, which is going to be equal to 15 divided by the square root of 0, which is going to be 15 divided by what? Just 0. Okay, we're done, right? No, what's the problem? It's undefined. Okay, and do I really need to do f of negative 5? Why don't we do it, just to be safe? Maybe we'll get something different. Well, let's see. Let's do f of negative 5 and see what happens. 3 times negative 5 on the top, right? Let's see what happens on the bottom. I'm going to do square root of 25 minus negative 5 squared. But I have to plug with parentheses, don't I? So I'm going to get what on top? Negative 15, and I'm going to have a bottom. I'm going to have square root. 25, what? What comes? 25. Minus 25 still, right? Why is that the same? The top changed, but the bottom's the same. Why? Yeah, because negative 5 squared is the same as 5 squared. So again, this is going to be negative 15 over 0, undefined. OK? Make sense? OK, so how about f of negative x? That's the last one. So let me paste one more time. So this was f of x, and we're supposed to find f of negative x. Well, how am I going to figure that out? What should I do? Well, what's been the process so far? I take wherever I see an x, right? I replace it by whatever is inside of the parentheses, right? which is like 5 in this case. So we replaced all the x's with 5's. Yeah? So now I have in my parentheses negative x. So is anything going to change meaningfully? What should be my process for, for figuring this one out? Yeah, I'm just going to change the x's to negative x's. The only thing that I'm going to be careful about, though, is anytime I'm plugging in, I always want to plug with parentheses, right? Always, always, always plug with parentheses. And you're going to see why that's important. Because if you don't plug with parentheses on this problem, you probably get it wrong. OK, so 3 times negative x divide square root. 25 minus negative x squared. What do I get on top? Negative 3x. Negative 3x. And on bottom? 25 minus x squared. 25 minus x squared. Okay, good. So, uh, one, one interesting thing that we can then talk about, right, 
one interesting thing that we can then talk about is what kind of relationship holds between f of x and f of negative x. Well, what's the, what's the big difference? Is there anything different in the denominator? No, the denominator is the same. What about the numerator? One of them is negative and one of them is positive, right? One of them is negative and one of them is positive. So if I plug in x and I get something, and if I plug in negative x, I get the negative of that thing, then would you agree with me that this is equal to negative f of x? Yes? Yes. So if I have f of x is equal to negative f of negative x, does that bring to mind anything from our class that we've learned about recently? Reflection. Close. Has something to do with symmetry. This is symmetry about the origin. What kind of function is symmetric about the origin? Huh? Odd. Is that what you said? <laughs> okay, odd function. <laughs> this is an odd function, right? This is an odd function. Let's graph it to see what it looks like. I mean, well, we're just going to look at it in Desmos. It's nothing, nothing crazy. Oops. Someone hopefully remembers what it was. It was three. Oh, are we doing which one? It was three x divided by the square root. Well, are you doing the positive one or the negative one? It doesn't matter. Okay, so look at what that looks like. That's kind of crazy. Um, but it makes complete sense. Uh, why does it make complete sense? Because we, ju we just found out that this function is odd. And indeed, if we look at the graph, it looks like it's symmetric about the origin, which is what odd functions are. All right. So would that be our answer for negative x overall? Or? No, for, 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 so, so the question was, evaluate f of negative x. My answer would be f of negative x is equal to negative 3x over the square root of 25 minus x squared. That would be my answer. How so? Okay, let's, let's, let's investigate. Is it true that the square root of 25 minus x squared is equal to um, 5 minus x? That's the question mark, right? What do we think? Is okay. Sorry. No, the answer, but I don't know why. Okay, so uh, I'll I'll say this is not true, not true. But let's see if we can see why. How how would I go about investigating whether whether or not this is true? You, okay. We want to square both sides. Is that what you're saying? No, like literally just take five minus. Right, so, so, so here's the problem, right? It, you could see this in any number of ways. Here's the first way you could see it, would be to say, what if I factored this? What would you get? You'd get the square root of 5 minus x times what? 5 plus, five plus x. Okay, are these two things the same? No, no. no. so if I, I can't take their square root and just get this one, can I? Mm -hmm. Right, so that's one way to see it. Here's another way that, to see it that's easier, and it comes back down to our old friend, the foil. 
What happens if I square both sides? On the left side, what do I get? 25 minus x squared. But how about the right side? I have to FOIL. 5 minus x times 5 minus x, right? And what would I get if I did that? I'd get 25 minus 5x minus 5x plus x squared. So is 25 minus x squared equal to 25 minus 10x plus x squared? No. These are different, right? OK, so that's one way that you can. I, I want you all to feel that, you know, if you have a thought and you're you know, it's perfectly fine if on a quiz or an exam or a homework you're like, oh, I think maybe this is that, but you're not totally sure. You don't necessarily have to run to Google and, and check Google. You can try to employ some kind of like checking system on your own, right? So for example, you could try to factor this guy and you'd see pretty quickly that that can't be the square root of that. Uh, but also you can try to square both sides, get rid of the square root, make it a little easier for yourself to see. Um, so yeah. Uh, in general, okay, x squared, okay, if we do x plus y squared, no, nah, God. If I do x plus y squared, we we cannot set this equal to just x squared plus y squared, right? What, what do we have to do? We have to FOIL, right? So for the same reason, the square root of x plus y is not equal to the square root of x plus the square root of y. Okay, so square roots are nonlinear, meaning we can't break them up like this. We can't just distribute. Okay, so that was really long-winded, but uh, that's why we can't simplify further. Does that answer your, your question? Okay. Okay. Uh, so my final answer would, would look like this, because this can't be simplified anymore. OK. Um, well, I mean, I suppose if you really wanted to, you could rationalize the denominator. But honestly, that's getting a little bit extra. I'll say if I want you to rationalize the denominator on the quiz problem. All right. Uh, so now we've actually fully finished that problem, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Should we do any other homework problems? I think the quiz is going to cover not just homework 1.4, but also homework 1.5, right? Um, so why don't I go look at the homework, and we can I'll click through, and you tell oh, I can't show you the grade book. <laughs> Manage assignments. Um, 1.5 is the one that I want. Let me see properties. It just says if the point 9, negative 14 is on the graph with function f, then f of 9 equals... Oh, OK. Let's answer that one first, because that one will be quick. If f of what? Um, well, it says if the point 9, negative 14 is on the graph with function f, then f 9 equals 9. Oh, OK. okay. Which question is it? Two? No, oh, thanks. OK, if 9, 14 is on the graph of f of x, negative 14, then. See, yeah, let me see. Yeah, okay, I gotcha. It just says is on the graph of f, then f. Okay, thank you. Got it. That's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So just f, then f of nine equals question mark. Okay. I think this is this is one that that I think some of you can probably help Emma with. How can I figure out the answer to this one? Someone help me go through the explanation. I know a lot of you can probably find the answer, right? But what's the explanation? That's that's what I'm hoping for. Can somebody give it a shot? 
Does it give you like an equation? No, that's why I was confused. So it says the point nine comma fourteen is on the graph of f, right? Piper. Would f nine be negative fourteen? F of nine would be negative fourteen. Mm, are you sure? Can you double check it for me? Are you sure you formatted it right? Because that means it's, it's so janky. Yeah. <laughs> you could be like, you could be oh, so I don't think I can even do it anymore because it's done. Try. Well, 1.5. Maybe it'll let you try another. It shows you your old answer now. <laughs> that works. <one person>. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, but why is this true? Yes, we can all see. And and okay maybe from okay if you were gonna make a if you were gonna make like an educated guess like without even knowing anything about math right I think negative fourteen would probably be like the first thing that you would guess but can someone give me an ex like mathematical ex explanation of why this is true? Yeah. Well, yes, but that's kind of like encapsulated in, in this statement, right? Which is what we're we're trying to explain why that's true. If you graph it and x is the x the value of x is nine, then it shows that the y value is fourteen. Exactly. So okay, basically, <laughs> you feel like you're saying the same thing. But here's what I was trying to get at. What I was trying to get at is that the points. The points which lie on the graph of a function are points of the form x comma f of x. So we know that 9 comma negative 14 is a point on the graph, which it wouldn't be here, where would it? It would be down here uh, somewhere, right? We know that 9 comma negative 14 is on the graph of f, which means that we know that 9 comma negative 14 satisfies that it is equal to 9 negative 14 is equal to x comma f of x which tells us okay roughly speaking this is about how do I know what the height of the point is going to be on the graph of a function you get the height of the point by plugging in the x value into the function okay so if I know the height and it asks me what is the value of the function? Well, the value of the function is synonymous with the height of the graph for a given x value. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah. So sometimes those like super easy questions are the hardest to answer. You know, like things that you've just taken for granted, like why is one plus one equal to two? You're just like, it just is, right? But there's actually like pages long proofs of why one plus one is equal to two. And people have thought really hard about these things. I mean, pages might be excessive, but. <laughs> well, you have to, I mean, if you wanna understand what is, what is one plus one and why is it equal to two, you have to understand first what is even addition, right? How is addition even defined? How is a number even defined, right? What is the number one as opposed to a number zero? And how do I know that they're not the same? Like these sorts of things, like intuitively you can take for granted and you can work your way through life without ever having to ask those questions. But like, if you want to understand it on a really deep level. This is somebody decided that they Why is one plus one two? Yeah, well, people have been wondering why 1 plus 1 is 2 for literally thousands of years. <laughs> what if it's not? Yeah. <laughs> we can come up with an alternative math system where it's not. We can just we can just say assume 1 plus 1 is not equal to 2, then derive uh, consequences from that, right? I don't like how you actually rationalize that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, anyways, I don't want to get too off track here. Let's get back to the subject matter at hand. Do we have any other uh, questions from 1.4, or should we move on to 1.5? Um, shall I look? Could we possibly go over how, for like, we had our first question at the top, 
how to find the x and y intercepts from that possibly. Sure, how to find the x and y intercepts of yeah. of uh yeah. th of this one? Yeah. Okay, let's do that. Scroll. Okay, so find x intercepts. For, let's do. Let's start with the x intercepts, right? Okay, so if I have a graph, and we already kind of know what this function looks like, don't we? It, we know it looks something like this, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna draw three points. A, B, and C, and I want you to tell me which ones, if any, correspond to x-intercepts. Here's point A, here's point B, and here's point C. Which ones, if any of them, are x-intercepts? Okay, very good. A and C. Why is B not an x-intercept? Because B is a y-intercept. How do I know the difference? It's like on top of the x-intercept. Okay, it's on top of the what? The x-axis, right? Which is this one, okay? So the x-axis is the one that goes from left to right, and the y-axis is the one that goes up and down, yes? Okay, so uh, the x-intercepts are going to be the points uh, which are on the x-axis. What is going to be true about both of these two points? What do they have in common? Their x value is 0, and their y value is TBD, right? OK, so to find the x-intercepts, um, no, the other way around, right? You guys are feeding me bad information, and I just go with it. <laughs> I'm sorry. OK, what's true about these two points is their y value is 0, oh, yeah. right? <laughs> OK. <laughs> so, Th that just goes to show how much I trust you all, right? Okay, question mark, comma, zero. Okay, so the y value of both of these points is zero. So to find the x-intercepts, what am I going to plug in zero for in my equation? To find the x-intercepts, I should plug in zero in this equation for what? Y. I don't have a Y in this equation. Where is that? F of X. F of X is Y, right? The height is F of X. Okay, so I plug in zero for Y. And I get zero equals 3X squared minus X minus 2. Okay, now what do I do? Plug zero in for X. I will get 0 equals 0. That's not very meaning. Well, I will get 0 equals negative 2, actually. That's worse than meaningless. That's wrong. OK, sorry. Uh, what should I do now? I, my goal is to find the x-intercepts. I set 0 equal to the right-hand side. What do I do now? Factor, good. Or use the quadratic formula if you want. Um, but okay, let's factor. How do I factor something like this? Grouping, right? Because I have a po I have a number here that's not one, right? So I need to use grouping. So a times c equals negative six, right? What are the factors of negative six? that could possibly sum to negative 1? I think negative 3 and positive 2 are the ones we want. So now I take 0 equals to 3x squared, and I'm going to do minus 3x, and then I'm going to do plus 2x, and then minus 2, right? And this means that 0 is equal to 3x squared minus 3x plus 2x minus 2, yes? Now what's my game? Ooh, I think I 
Greatest common factor from both. What's the greatest common factor of this one? 3x. And what is left inside? x minus 1. Okay, then a plus sign. What's the greatest common factor of the second one? 2. And then what's left inside? x minus 1. So how does this factor? 0 equals 2. 3x plus 2. Where did those come from? Right here and right here. Yeah? And where does the x plus 1, x minus 1 come from? It comes from here. Right? This is like I have 3x of something plus 2 of something. When you have uh, two, like multiples of a certain type of object, the way you combine them is you add up however many you have. Right? Okay, maybe that was too abstract to make much sense saying it out loud. Okay, so now what? I need to solve still, right? So zero product property tells us 3x plus 2 equals 0 or x minus 1 equals 0. x minus 1 equals 0 means that x would be equal to 1, and this one means that x would be equal to negative 2 thirds, right? Move the 2 over, divide by 3. So those are my x-intercepts, right? As technically, to be perfectly correct, what we should do is we should put them in negative 2 thirds, 0, and uh, 1, 0, right? These are the x-intercepts. Okay, so that's the points which are shown here and here. All right, how about the y-intercepts? What am I going to do? Well, how many y-intercepts am I going to have? One. Just one, right? It's this one down here, right? What is the form of that point? Do we know anything about it? Well, the y value is definitely negative. How about the x value? Zero. It's zero, right? The x value of this point is zero. Why? Because it's touching the y axis, which means it's not going, it's not left at all, it's not right at all. It's right smack dab in the middle in terms of left and right. Yeah? So there's no, uh, the x value is zero. So it has the form zero comma something. And our goal is to find out what is the something. So, I know the x value is 0, so what should I do? I'm going to take this equation and do what? So if the x value is 0, my goal is to find the height. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to plug in 0 for x, right? So to find the height of the function, when x is 0, I just plug in 0 into the function rule, right? So f of 0 is equal to 3 times 0 squared minus 0 minus 2, which is what? Negative 2, right? So 0 comma negative 2 is the y-intercept. All right. Any questions on those two, finding x-intercepts or, or finding y-intercepts? Um, OK. Then let's move on to 1.5. I want to talk about 1.5 at least a little bit. So let's see some problems. And you tell me if, if, uh, if any of these suit your fancy. We've got problem about decreasing, problem about even functions. We've got average rate of change, um, some true and false problems. Is this due today, right? Or no, tomorrow? Yeah, it's due tomorrow. But we covered 1.5 on Monday. Mm -hmm. 
Um, let's see. Maybe I can find a good representative problem for us. something like this maybe it's even, right? okay we'll get there don't get ahead of me now okay. we're gonna do more than just that Now let's uh, let, let's take a look at this one, and we'll talk about a handful of things. Okay, so uh, we have a function here, and they give us the graph. And let's first answer the question as written, which says uh, f is even, odd, or neither, and we want to circle one. So why don't I say is odd? Is is f? Jesus. Is F even, odd, or neither? Okay, what do we think? Someone already said even. Is that you, Emma? Wait. Is this different? I'm looking at oh, 31. I'm on 31. Aren't I? Oh, question 13. Uh, I'm looking at this number here. 1.5.31. <laughs> yeah, it's question 13 on the homework. Does yours look different? Yeah. Okay, well that's fine. But let's let's answer this problem. So maybe you can make a drawing on your paper. And uh, oh god, where did my Do I still have that? Oh, thank god. Okay. <laughs> Um, all right, let's take a look at this one. Okay, do we think that this function is even or odd or neither? Sorry? Even. Okay, even is correct. Can you justify your answer? Because if you were to flip it, it would be the exact same. Okay, flip it like how? Like this? Uh, it would be the same shape, yes. But. So what we need to think about for the flipping of whether if we have an even function is that if we flip it horizontally, okay, meaning across the y-axis, it will be the same. Okay, so in other words, if I had a mirror right here, okay, this picture would be consistent, right? This, this makes sense. If I put a mirror here, you can imagine that yes, it would have a reflection which looks just like that, right? Okay, so it's symmetric about the y-axis. So what does that mean? What that means is if you pick a x value and you look at this point, x comma y, then there should also be another point on the graph of the function. And the corresponding point to this one is going to be where? On the, other side. on the other side, over here, right? And what are the coordinates of that point? If the coordinates of this point are 
x, y, what are the coordinates of this one? Negative, negative x, comma, y. Same y value, right? OK, so these two need to both be on the graph. So if I plug in x, I get a certain height. If I plug in negative x, I must get the same height. That is what it means to be an even function. That, well, that's what it means to be symmetric about the y-axis, right? Which even functions are symmetric about the y-axis. OK, so I say even. What would it look like if it was odd? Well, it would need to, first of all, it would need to uh, be symmetric about the origin, right? Which maybe could look something like this. Something like that could be symmetric about the origin, right? What that means is that if x comma y is on the graph on this side, what needs to be on the graph of the other side? Negative x comma negative y. Okay, that would be odd. All right. So now let's answer something more complicated. Let's describe subregions of the domain on which f of x is increasing. OK, let's start by identifying the parts of the graph which are increasing. Can someone help me do that? It's increasing from negative 1, 0 to uh, 0, 1. OK, this part and also this part, right? Those are the two parts of the graph that are increasing, yes? Why am I increasing on those points? Or on those uh, sections of the graph? Why do we call this increasing and, and, and not this? Because the y-axis is going up. Because the y-axis is going up as I move from what? Right to left? No, left to right. We're always moving left to right. OK? So I just don't want anyone to get confused with the uphill-downhill notion, OK? Because depending on the direction that you're going, this could be uphill or downhill, right? But we're always, always moving to the right, OK? So when I say uphill or downhill, it's always with respect to we're always walking left to right. OK, so this is an uphill portion. And this is an uphill portion. Uphill portions are increasing. OK, now, what I'm supposed to do to describe the subregions of the domain, OK? Now, the domain is what? The domain is all of the x values, which go from negative 3 up to 3. OK, negative 3 up to 3. So if I want to describe the subregion of the domain, OK, then I want to talk about the x values which correspond to sections on the graph which are increasing. So those x values are going to be found on the x-axis going from here to here and also from here to here, right? Those are the subregions of the domain which I need to describe. Using interval notation, what would that look like? I would need a union. Then what? One to three. Okay, and should I have brackets or parentheses? Always parentheses when we're doing increasing and decreasing. Okay, why do I not include the point? here as increasing well depending on whether you come from the left or come from the right okay or whether you, you know, it's better to say whether you go to this point or whether you are leaving this point you could be increasing or decreasing right so that's why we're not increasing or decreasing at that point okay 
How about the subregions of the domain which are decreasing? What would they be? Answer equals what? Someone else helped me out who, who hasn't helped me already. So Alexa, you're out. Who else is out? All right, Lawson, what's up? Negative three, the negative one, and then union, and then zero to one, right? Very good. Negative three to negative one, right, which is this region here. And then, well, why don't I do it like this? This region, yeah. And then the other x values where we're decreasing are going to be the x values between zero and one, yeah? OK. Any questions on this one? Figuring out even or odd, or uh, figuring out where we're increasing or decreasing? Um, didn't I have this open already? Oh, I just minimized it. There it is. Okay, let's see if there's any other interesting ones. We asked questions about minimal and maximal numbers. Sorry? We asked this question about minimal and maximal numbers. Yeah, I could I could definitely ask a question about that. Let's try one more even or not one where we do it algebraically instead of graphically. So let's try this one is and let me switch the color that's too just that's too not visible i'll do lavender f of x equals x to the 9 plus x cubed okay great is it even odd neither well how am I supposed to check? I don't know what the graph of that thing looks like. That could be all kinds of craziness. Oh, there we go. You can see now. Okay, I don't know what the graph of that looks like. Do you? Exactly. So how do I check when I don't have the graph? How do I check? That's right. We know that if we are even, then f of x will be what? Equal to f of negative x, yes? That was the definition of evenness. What was the definition of oddness? Looks like this, but different. How so? It's just f of x is equal to negative f of negative x. Okay? So this, these are the two things we have to check. If this one's true, it's even. If this one's true, it's odd. If, ne if neither of them are true, then neither of them are true. Okay? So let's check. Let's start with the even one. We want to see, is x cubed... No x to the 9 plus x cubed equal to, and I'm putting a question mark over this equal sign because I don't know yet. That's what I'm trying to figure out. Is it equal to negative x all being to the power 9 plus negative x all being to the power 3? How can I tell whether this is true or not? Well, I can simplify the right-hand side, right? What do I get when I do negative x and I multiply it with itself nine times? Is it going to be negative or positive? Negative. It should be negative, right? Because an odd power, right? And then x to the nine. Yes? OK, now plus, what do I get when I do negative x all cubed? Negative x cubed, good. So what do we think? 
Is x to the 9 plus x cubed equal to negative x to the 9 minus x cubed? No. If you want to see why, just plug in 1. What would you get? 1 to the 9 plus 1 cubed. You get 1 plus 1 on this side. On the other side, you get negative 1 minus 1. Is 2 equal to negative 2? No. Right? So that's how you know that that's not true. All right. What about oddness? The oddness was we want to check is f of x ugh, is f of x equal to negative f of negative x? Well, we already figured out what this part is. We already figured out what f of negative x is, right? It's this guy, yes? So this would mean that x to the 9 plus x cubed, we want to check, is that equal to, well, what would I get if I took this and I made it negative? You would get x to the 9 plus x cubed, right? In fact, why don't I keep it negative for a second? Just so I can show exactly how I did that. So I, I started with what's in the yellow box, right? And what, I, what was I supposed to do to it? I was supposed to make it negative, yes? So if I take this negative sign, I have to, of course, distribute it onto each of these two terms, yes? So this would be x to the 9 plus x cubed, yeah? OK, so is the equality valid or not? Yeah, yeah it is, right? f of x is equal to negative f of negative x in this case. So it's true. So not even was our first conclusion. It is odd is our second conclusion. OK? Any questions on that one? So can someone summarize for me in general, how do I check whether a function's even or odd without the graph? Set it equal to negative x. Well, set what equal to negative x, right? First, what I want to do is I want to take f of x. And then what I want to do is what? Figure out what is f of negative x, right? That's the next step, is to plug in negative x. So this goes back to that problem that we started at the first Part, right where we were practicing plugging with parentheses right we plug negative x in with parentheses and see what we get if it's the same then it's even if what we get is the negative of what we started with then it's odd and if neither of those two things are true then we just say neither of them are true that's perfectly acceptable OK, any questions on that one? OK, let's do a relative min-max. Could we do a rate of change? Sure. Um, OK, let's. Let's just take a look at this one and do this together. I'm not going to I'm not going to present this one on the on the board because I want to point. OK, where do we have a minimum, a, a relative minimum on this graph? Negative 7 over 2 minus 3. We all agree with that? Yeah, how can I tell it's a minimum? It's the bottom. It's the bottom, right? OK, how about the other two points? What are they? Maximums. Relative maximums, right? OK, so what we need to make sure is that it's the tallest point in a subregion. It doesn't necessarily have to be the tallest point overall. It just needs to be the tallest point in a neighborhood, right? It's kind of like, who's played sports before in high school or something like that? OK, or you've competed in some form of competition. OK, well, at least you're aware of these things, right? You know that if you are on a competitive sports team or a quiz bowl or something like that, right, you can be the state champs or the national champs or the world champs, right? 
depends on how big of a region you're considering, right? So what is seven, what is zero four? Zero four is like a state champ, but not a national champ, right? It's like the best around, but only if you consider a small region, yeah? And then seven, seven, that's the global champ, right? The world champ. All right, that's, that's basically all I want to say about minimums and maximums. Is there any like algebraic thing we'll have to worry about that for this? Or? Not really. Um, the, the you give us like a form of function or something like that. I'm not going to give you this problem because this problem is tricky. It's a trick question, kind of. You have to be careful with the definition. All right, uh, let's do a average rate of change. 22. 22, okay. It says, average rate of change of f of x, which is two, negative 2x plus 8, from a equals negative 1 to b equals 3. OK, so this is a straight up memorization problem in terms of did you memorize the formula of average rate of change, right? So does anybody know what the formula is? Anyone want to take a stab? It's okay if you're wrong. F of b minus f of a uh, over b minus a. Very good, you nailed it. Okay, the easy way to remember it is it's kind of like the slope formula, right? This is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. It's nothing but the slope formula. Rise over run. Yeah? All right, so let's do it. Except, crap. What is B and what is A? Well, B is 3, right? So I'm going to replace B by 3. Well, actually, why don't I just uh, leave that there and rewrite? So this is going to be F of 3 minus F of negative 1 all divided by 3 minus negative 1, which of course is going to be f of 3 minus f of 1 all over 4, right? Because 3 minus negative 1 is 4. Am I done? No, no what did I not do? You have to do the formula with... Uh, the do the formula. Can you do, be more specific? Do the, do fill in the function with... Exactly, I gotta plug 3 in for x in this function, right? And then I gotta plug in negative 1, which I miswrote it down here. Okay, so what do I get when I plug in 3? I get negative 2. Okay, I wanna finish this up, and I want you to tell me if I did it right, okay? I'm gonna do negative 2 times 3, of course I plug with parentheses, and then plus 8. Okay, then comes a minus sign. And now I need to do f of negative one. And I'm gonna be very careful. I'm gonna plug with parentheses, negative two times negative one. And then um, plus eight again, right? And then I just divide by four. So all I have to do is add these things up. This becomes negative six plus eight uh, minus positive two, right? And then plus eight over four. And then that's just, okay, well, negative 6 plus 8 is 2, minus 2 is 0, plus 8 is 8, so I get 8 over 4 is equal to 2. And I was very careful to make sure I plugged with parentheses. So that's definitely not a problem. Did I do it right? You know every time I ask you, did I do it right, that I didn't do it right. <laughs> right? But where's the mistake? Where is the mistake? Um, the parentheses around the second thing. Very good. What was I supposed to do? I was supposed to subtract f of negative 1, which means I need to subtract all of f of negative 1, which means I need to put parentheses around here which means that I would get not minus 2 plus 8, but what? What should be here instead of minus 2 plus 8 if I have parentheses shown above? 
should be minus two minus eight, right? Or, or six, yeah, if you combine them first, that's also fine. Okay, so be careful when we do average rate of change. We're subtracting a whole thing here. We gotta put parentheses. And reasonably speaking, this is, this is the same as plugging with parentheses, right? I'm plugging with parentheses because I'm replacing by f of three by something that it's equal to, right? I'm plugging here. Always plug with parentheses. It's just a little bit of a different style of doing so, okay? All right, so that was a trick question by me. So the minus eights cancel out and I'm left with what? Negative six minus two, which is negative eight over four, which is negative two. Okay, so I was off by a negative sign basically before. All right, does this one, how do you feel about this one? You feel like you could do this on your own? Okay, I think it comes down to memorizing this formula, right? So this is an, who's got flashcards in this, car, in this class? Do you want me to bring some flashcards in, maybe? I could distribute them for you all. I feel like, look, it could be useful for things like this, where you have to memorize the formula, or it could be useful for the things like we talked about in class, where you want to memorize those, uh, the, the graphs of those functions. I think it, it really could be quite helpful. Because if you can just write this down, like, okay, if, if I gave you this problem, find the average rate of change from here to here. If you wrote down average rate of change equals f of b minus f of a over b minus a, you don't need to do any math to, to write that down. But I would give you partial credit if you wrote down the formula because I say, aha, at least you know the formula. You just had a little bit of trouble plugging in, right? That, that's half the battle. So you would get a reasonable number of points there, okay? All right. Any other questions on the average rate of change problem? Okay. Um, what else should we do? Anything else that we want to talk about? I like seven minutes left. I thought I deleted this problem. Didn't I delete this problem? Does anyone have the homework up? Emma, can you check that for me? What? Can you check if tw question 26 is on there? No. It's not? Okay, good. Um, let's see, were there any others? No. Oh, I left this one on here. Maybe we can do this one just for fun. Because this one I suspect probably you all will have a bit of a hard time with on the homework. Oh, you're going to say it's on the quiz? No. <laughs> I'm not going to put this problem on the quiz. Because this problem's hard, but this problem's fun. <laughs> In a manner of speaking. Why are all my questions different than yours? Well, the numbers will be different. Yeah, I think that's why. It's always the same idea for both. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Okay, let's see if I can draw this properly. Not really. Oh my god. Okay, there we go, now I have it drawn, and this is x. Okay, so... Okay, let me make it vis visible, oh, and it's 11 by 11. I 
I assume they mean that this original distance was 11. Okay, so let's see. So this was a problem on our homework assignment that's pretty tricky. Um, we have a cardboard box, right? And so you can imagine that if you cut this out of a piece of paper, right, you could take this piece, let me draw it. You could take this piece, right, and fold it inward, and then this piece and fold it inward at a 90 degree angle. Take this piece, fold it inward at a 90 degree angle, and take this piece and fold it inward at a 90 degree angle, and you'd end up with a box, right, with no top. Agree? Are we all on board with that? Okay, so we would have a box if we folded this in. Okay, and our goal is to find out what would the volume of that box be. So it says that we take a chunk out, right? We take a chunk out of, of length x. So this length here is x and this length here is x, but it doesn't tell us how big that chunk is. It could look more like this, right? It could look crazier. It could look like this, yeah? Uh, and then like like that, and then also this this, sh this should have gone down, and then also like this, right? It doesn't tell us how big uh, the chunk is that we take out, right? But if you think about the volume of these two boxes, which can be seen here, the volume of the purple one, okay, although it is not as tall of a box, it's a lot wider, right? But if I cut it out like shown with the red, then the box would be not as wide, but it would be significantly taller, agree? So the question is, I take out a, a chunk and I don't tell you how big the chunk is. I want you to tell me in general, if I take out a chunk of that is X units long from each of the corners, what is going to be the volume of the new box Okay, what is going to be the volume of the new box? Okay, so let's work through this one together. Does anyone have a any ideas on how to how to start? Okay, well, what if we started with a, a description of how do I get the volume of a box? Length times width times height, right? <coughs> Length times width times height. Do I know what the height of the box is going to be? X. Yeah. Do you all see how the height of the box is going to be X? Mm -hmm. Right? Because if I fold this in, then the height is going to be whatever this distance is. Yes? So the height is going to be X. OK, and let's say that this is the width and this is the length. Right? Well, you agree with me that since this is a square, the length is equal to the width, right? So I can actually make this L squared, yeah? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. And how about what is L? Well, L is this distance, right? Do I know what that distance is? 15. 15? Oh, well, yours is 11, but mine is 15. Is this oh, no, distance I I 15? I, I was kidding. That's okay. I was just kidding. There is an 11 involved, right? It's 11 is this distance here. But I don't understand. How do I figure out what is the distance shown here? This is somewhat shorter, right? That's right. 11 minus 2x, right? L is 11 minus 2x, yes? So if I wanted to find the volume of the box, it would just be equal to 11 minus 2x all squared. And I multiply that with x, yeah? Okay. Why is that true? Because if I were to take this box out, right, what would it look like? It would look like something like this, yes? Something like this. Where this height here is x, and then this length here is 11 minus 2x, and then this length here is 11 minus 2x, right? So length times width times height, I get 11 minus 2x times 11 minus 2x, 
times x. Okay? All right. Well, it's four o'clock, so we'll probably stop there unless anyone has a, maybe a final question they want to ask. Find the domain of this. I can do it on my homework. The domain of this? Yeah, it asks for it. The domain of the Okay. Well, well, what 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 could x be? Yeah, x definitely has to be greater than or equal to 0, right? Because I can't not take a chunk out. Otherwise, I wouldn't have a box, right? So actually, it should be greater than 0, right? Because otherwise, I won't form a cube at all. I'll just have a piece of paper. Yes. OK, what do, we, what do we think about x should be less than 11? Agree? No, why not? OK, let me show you what it would look like if I took a chunk of size 11 out from here. I would be taking a chunk which looks like this. It'd start here, and I'd go 11 units. That goes all the way over to here. And then 11 units down, that goes all the way over to here. I would take a chunk out, which was this big. And I needed to take three more of them out. You see the problem? How, how much of a chunk can I really maximally take out? I can only take out a chunk which is as big as OK, this would be like, as big as we could make it would be if I did something like, like this, right? If I took chunks out like that, yeah? And then, and then another one here like that, and then another one here like that, right? If I took chunks out that were really big like that, then I'd just have a box which was super thin but really tall, yeah? So what's the most that I can take out? Well, that would be if I took out almost half of the entire length, right? So 5.5 5. 5 would be the maximum that I could take out. Actually, I can't quite take out 5.5. 5. I want x is strictly less than 5.5. 5. Yeah? Is that clear? Still a little confusing, maybe, but that's OK. This is a tricky problem. All right, any final questions? All right, then we'll stop there for today. I will post this recording to my YouTube channel. <laughs>